Well, hello, hearth and homies. Thanks for joining us for the six shooter. I feel like I need a cowboy hat for this one. So this classic old time radio Western stars Jimmy Stewart as Britt Ponzit, a gunfighter in the old West. Now this show was on the air only for one season. It ran from September 20th, 1953 until June 24th, 1954. And it ran on NBC's radio network. Now this show also featured some of your favorite performers. Throughout the episodes, you're going to hear Virginia Gregg, Parley Bear, Harry Bartell, Howard McNear, Alan Reed, and William Conrad, and many others. Now, it's interesting that William Conrad is sometimes credited as Julius Craborn, and this is because he was playing Marshal Matt Dillon over at CBS in Gunsmoke. Now, of course, the big draw for this show was Jimmy Stewart. One of the things NBC wanted to do was attract attention to the show by hiring a big name Hollywood star for it. One of the things I think is interesting about the show is it was directed by Jack Johnstone. And many of you know Johnstone from his work on Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, which he directed when Bob Bailey was Johnny Dollar. Those are considered some of the best episodes of the series. So this is a strong show. It's created by Frank Burt, stars Jimmy Stewart, directed by Jack Johnstone. A lot of positive things going on here. Now, of course, over here on Hearth and Home Entertainment, we've also added the OTR Visual Radio to give you a unique old time radio viewing experience. So sit back, relax and enjoy the show. And as always, thanks for tuning in. Now, just before we start the show, I just want to remind you that this channel has been monetized, demonetized, remonetized and demonetized or is that re-demonetized? I don't know. But anyway, we're no longer a part of the YouTube partner program, but that's okay because we have the Hearth and Home partner program, which features you, the viewer. Now, I know you might say, Mr. H, YouTube is free. And it is. It's a free platform that's ad supported. It does take time and money to put together these shows and run a channel like this. And many channels keep going because they're able to run ads on YouTube. So one of the things I'd like you to consider is joining the Johnny Dollar Club. That's right, for just a dollar a month, you can help support this channel. Now, forgive me if you've heard me talk about this, but it's very important right now that we get as many people as we can supporting the channel. For just a dollar a month, you'll get access to some exclusive content, and you're also helping to keep Hearth and Home Entertainment on the air. So please take a minute to click one of the links in the description below, see what support level works for you, and consider supporting this channel. If you've enjoyed it at all, we'd love for you to be a part of keeping this channel going. Thank you so much for being a part of the Hearth and Home Entertainment family. And now I hope you'll enjoy tonight's show. just a moment, you'll hear James Stewart as the Six Shooter, only one of the many fine programs brought to you Sundays on NBC. Each Sunday, listen to the music of the NBC Symphony Orchestra broadcasting from Carnegie Hall. Hear the amusing adventures of Hume Cronin and Jessica Tandy in The Marriage, and tune to the NBC Star Playhouse for the nation's greatest stars. It's a lineup of wonderful programs, all of them heard only on NBC. James Stewart as... The Six Shooter. The man in the saddle is angular and long-legged. His skin is sun-dyed brown. The gun in his holster is gray steel and rainbow mother of pearl. Its handle unmarked. People call them both The Six Shooter. The NBC Radio Network presents James Stewart as The Six Shooter, a transcribed series of radio dramas based on the life of Britt Ponsett, the Texas Plainsman who wandered through the Western territories, leaving behind a trail of still-remembered legends. Now, in just a moment, immediately following this important announcement, you'll hear Act One of The Six Shooter. A Christmas gift with a future... That's how everyone feels about a gift of United States savings bonds. Because when those bonds mature, they pay back $4 for every $3 invested. What's more, they can be held as long as 10 years beyond maturity and earn even further interest. Give a gift of United States savings bonds. Now, Act One of The Six Shooter, starring James Stewart. <laughs> I 
expected to stay over in Smoke Falls, but when I stopped off to see old Dad Somerset and found him all crippled up with lumbago, well, I, of course, he didn't ask me to look after his stock, but I could see he sure wanted me to, so... Well, a couple of weeks later, I... He began feeling better, so I started thinking about moving on. It was nearly five o'clock in the afternoon that day. The sun just spilled over the top of Eagle Mountain when the buckboard pulled into the yard. Mr. Ponsor? Oh, evening, ma'am. Mr. Ponsor, I'm Grace Proudly. Oh, pleased to meet you, Miss Proudly. I've been meaning to come out and see how Mr. Somerset's been getting along, but I just never have a minute's free time. It's canning season, you know. Yes, ma'am. Well, Dad's feeling much better. If you'd like to talk to him, he's no, right in. No, no, just say that I asked for him. As a matter of fact, it's you I want to talk to, Mr. Ponsor. Oh? You see, I'm president of the Ladies' Aid Society of Smoke Falls. Uh-huh. We're affiliated with the church and do lots of charity work, Christmas baskets and things like that, you know. All the best ladies in town members, and we don't just take in everybody either. Well, I, Now, this I, is what I'm getting at, Mr. Ponson. Tonight's our box supper and square dance. It's an annual event. Mr. Simply always loans us his barn for the occasion. I've spent the whole afternoon helping with the decorations. Now, Polly Sullivan, that's Wade Sullivan's wife, she's chairman of the decorating committee, but since I'm president, I felt it was my duty to give her a hand. That's what made me so late coming out here to ask you. To ask me? Uh, uh, about attending the supper. Oh, oh, now, well, I'm I'm not going to take no for an answer. Oh, but Miss Proudly... To tell you the truth, I... Well, I've already told folks you were planning to come. Oh, but you shouldn't have done that. Now, after all, you're practically the first celebrity we've ever had in Smoke Falls. The auction starts at 7.30. You won't be late, will you, Mr. Ponson? Oh, but And one more thing. Would you mind wearing your gun? The men folks are especially interested in that. Get up, Sheila. Come on, Sullivan. Oh, but... uh, Wait a... Wait a minute, Miss Proudly... Say there, Miss Proudly. Oh, dear. Well, after I gave Dad his supper, I washed my face and wet down my hair and started off for old man Simpling's barn. When I got there, Miss Proudly met me at the door and introduced me around... The only name that sank in was her daughter, Ellen. Pretty girl. I figured that when the box supper sheet pack was put up for sale, the bidding would be mighty serious. All right, everybody, we're ready to begin the auction. We don't want the music now, Wilbur. Wilbur! Now, just gather around the table here so you can get a good look at what you're buying. But remember, you can't judge a book by its cover. (laughs) Now, which one shall we start with? Oh, my, look at this one. Pretty pink ribbon and white tissue paper. Why, I'll just bet you there's a whole fried chicken inside this box. Now, who's going to make the first bid? A dollar, 50 cents. Don't forget, gentlemen, a pretty lady's company goes with the supper. I'll give a nickel. (laughs) Now, Spud Hooker, you stop joshing. You know we don't take any bid less than the court. Now, who offered a quarter just to get things underway? Look at this lovely box. Just think some nice young lady spent the whole day fixing it up. Then she'll be too tired to dance. (laughs) (laughs) Come on, somebody. Twenty-five cents. Why, it cost more than that. The auction was kind of slow in picking up momentum. But when Mrs. Proudly started in to make the third sale, well, there wasn't much doubt whose supper she was selling. Ellen Proudly sort of reddened in the cheeks and tried to look unconcerned. I, I saw her give somebody a glance on the other side of the room, almost like a signal. Couldn't tell who it was intended for, but there were two fellas standing over there. Spud Hooker is one, tall, husky, about 25. He'd been cracking jokes and acting sort of like he owned the place. The other boy was kind of a different sort. He's thinner, shorter. He hadn't opened his mouth since I got there. Now, now let's see if you can't do a little better this time, gentlemen. Here's the next supper. Oh, boy. Why, it looks familiar. Oh, I guess I shouldn't have said anything, should I? Ellen will just about murder me when I get home. Oh! Well, as long as the cat's out of the bag, I might as well go ahead with the sale. Fifty cents. Bud Hooker bid fifty cents. A supper like this ought to be worth more than half a dollar. 
<laughs> a little bird told me there's a chocolate cake inside. Uh, yeah. uh, 75 cents, ma'am. I've got 75. Now, what about a spud? You're not going to let Tom Leverett outbid you? Dollar. One dollar. I'm bid. One silver dollar. Who'll give a dollar and a quarter? Dollar and a quarter. Don't forget, gentlemen, it's all for charity. Dollar and a half. Now we're getting somewhere. I'm bid a dollar and 50 cents. Spud Hooker offers a dollar and 50 cents. Are there any more bids? Two dollars. You're bidding two dollars, Tom? Yes, ma'am. Three dollars. Oh, three? That's what I said. Well, now we all appreciate your enthusiasm, boys. But remember, this isn't the only supper you can buy. It's the only one I'm buying, and I'll take it right... Four dollars. Huh? Well, all right, all right. Going once, going twice, and it's all... Five dollars. Now, uh, now, Spud, are I'll you be sure... six dollars, Miss Proudly. You're oh. making a fool of yourself, Leverett. Ellen wants to eat with me. My, my bid's six dollars. Seven. Now, boys! Ten. Oh, now, you don't mean that, Tom. You can't afford ten dollars. No, I mean it. Well, all right. I'm bid ten dollars. Are there any more bids? I'm going once. Going twice? Go ahead, sell it to him. It ain't going to do him no good. Now, we don't want any trouble, Spud. Ellen's my girl, and she's eating with me. I'll take that box, Miss Proudly. Here's your money. Didn't you hear what I said? She's eating with me. Get out of the way, Spud. You're not man enough to make me move. Now, give me that box, or I'll take it away from you. Okay, Tom, you hurt me. <laughs> Hold on there. Now, just a minute here. Now, hold on. It don't concern you, Ponton. No, maybe it doesn't. Maybe it doesn't concern me. It just seems to me that there ought to be a better place for settling things. That's all. Uh, uh, Mr. Mr. Ponsett's right, Spud. Let's... Well, let's go out. Hey, hey, where, where's Britt Ponsett? Dad Thomas said he was over here. Yeah, I'm uh, Ponsett. Oh, uh, Miss Ponsett, uh, Sheriff Tinsmith told me to find you. What's the matter, Jake? Yeah. Dink Falk just broke out of jail. Oh, yeah, yes. He, he shot the sheriff in the back while he was getting away. Oh, he did. Hey, hey, well, we, we took him over to Doc Foster's, and he's bleeding pretty bad. He, he wants to talk to Mr. Ponsett before... Well, before he... I'll get my horse. <laughs> Glad. Glad you got here, Britt, before... Now, now, what are you talking about, Ray? You're going to be all right. The doc says you'll be back on your feet again inside of a week or so. I don't know what I was thinking of. I didn't think Paul get hold of my gun while I was serving the supper. Must be... Must be getting careless, my old age. Now, well, you're not the first man to have trouble with Falk. He had a pretty fancy reputation, from what I hear. Yeah, that's... That's why I had to see you, Britton. My fault he got loose, and I... I don't want other folks to pay for my mistakes. Well, what do you mean? I know this town, Brett. They'll... I'll get a posse together and start after Falk. Well, let's... And they'll catch him, too. But... Going out in a crowd like that, he'll hear him coming. Falk's a wildcat killer, Brett. When he's cornered, he won't give up. Pick off three or four of the posse before they can close in. Well, not if they're careful. That's the trouble, though. Fellas here ain't cautious. They're bullheaded, but... But you'd know how to take him, Brett. All no, right. I ain't saying it's your duty. You don't even live in Smoke Falls, but you could capture Falk without him having a chance to... No, no, to... I'm afraid you're giving me too much credit, Ray. If I, you want somebody to go along, any of the boys... Sure, I know that, I'd but... be mighty grateful, Brett. The folks here have been good to me. Wouldn't like to leave them thinking that because of me... Because what I did, some of them was going to... No, 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 you better take it easy. I, I, Just I, I take know, it easy. it's asking a lot. Falk's a good shot. And a wildcat killer. It's asking... <laughs> We'll return to James Stewart as the six-shooter in just a moment. Recently, the American Red Cross was called on for immediate and dramatic expansion of its part in the national blood program, 
was asked to make available all the gamma globulin possible for the prevention of paralysis from polio. Experiments conducted over the past two years have demonstrated the effectiveness of this treatment. It takes approximately one pint of blood to make an average dose of gamma globulin as used for polio. And one injection protects a child for a period of one to five weeks. Therefore, there is a tremendous need for blood donations now, so that we may be able to do our utmost to safeguard our children during the epidemic period next summer. At the same time, there has been no let-up in the need for blood for use overseas and for the thousands of wounded men in our military hospitals who are still fighting for a chance to live. If you are an adult, call your local Red Cross chapter right away. Get an appointment to make a donation of your blood for the National Blood Program, which aims to supply the total blood needs of the country. Join the thousands of Americans who are rolling up their sleeves. Take pride in having helped save a life. Now, Act Two of The Six Shooter, starring James Stewart as Britt Ponson. Sheriff Tinsmith had been right about the town foreman of Posse. We hadn't lost any time. Spud Hooker was taking charge. I was kind of surprised to see that Tom Leverett was along. But I figured he and Hooker sort of joined forces for the time being. How is he, Ponza? Well, he passed out a few minutes ago. Maybe it's just as well. At least he's getting some rest. Yeah, well, we're going after a fall. The other boys are waiting behind the mercantile. Uh-huh. Uh, looks like you got caught a gang. I ain't got no objection to having you go along, too. Not that we need you, you understand. Yeah. Well, you coming? Well, I had a little talk with the sheriff just before he lost consciousness. He, he seemed to think that taking out a posse after Falk wasn't such a good idea. What's he want us to do, let him go scot-free? No, no. No, Sheriff Tinsmith sort of suggested maybe one or two men would have a better chance of catching him. They can make faster time, maybe sneak up on Falk unaware. Oh, yeah? Hey, yeah. Well, it's okay with me. You going to be one of the boys who goes after him, Ponset? Mm, well, I haven't exactly made up my mind. You better make it up faster. I'll take somebody else. Oh, oh, I see. Uh, well, in that case, I... Oh, 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 oh. Say, uh, your name's Leverett, isn't it? That's right, Mr. Ponset. Tom Leverett. Mm-hmm. You want to ride along with me? Huh? Why, sure. Uh, wait a minute here. I thought you said one or two men. Mm-hmm, I did. Well, we don't need Leverett, then. Well, I tell you, I sort of figured maybe you ought to stay in town, Hooker. So if Tom and I get into trouble, well, you could bring the posse out later. Huh? You're trying to make a fool out of me, Ponsett? No, no, I'm not. Everybody knows I'm twice the man Leverett is. I can ride better and shoot faster and I'll fight him two to one. Mm-hmm. You want the credit for catching Falk yourself, don't you? Well, it ain't going to work out that way. Come on, boy. I'll find Falk myself and I'll bring him in alone. That's how I... Hey! Well, Tom, let's go, huh? Fox Trail headed west, up toward Eagle Mountain. And the moon was out, sort of a half moon, but it gave us enough light so we could follow the hoof prints Fox horse had left. Along about midnight, we spotted another trail, fresher. It couldn't have been more than a couple of minutes old. It cut in from one side and then went on ahead in the same direction Falk was riding. Ah. You see that, Tom? Yeah. Looks like Spud Hooker took a shortcut. Yeah. You reckon he'll beat us to him? Oh, you never know. Never know. If he does, he might save us some grief, would he, huh? <laughs> You're not anxious to tangle with Falk, are you, Mr. Ponson? No, no. No, I'm not anxious to tangle with anybody, Tom. But I thought, well, you brought in other outlaws before. Oh, some. Some, not as many as folks think, but uh, I've never enjoyed tangling with any of them. Why'd you pick me? Spud's right. He is twice the man I am. That's shooting, maybe. Yeah. 
right, but there's more to trail on a killer than being able to shoot. You know, lots of times it's more important for a man to know when not to shoot, you know. Huh? Yeah. Well, I was itching to pull a trigger like Spud. Well, he's, he's apt to pull it too soon. And, uh, hey, look at that. The moon's going down. We might as well get some shot eye. Whoa, boy. Post guard. Uh, he couldn't see the trail anyway. Spud won't be stopping for sleep. No, no, I don't suppose he will. That's another reason I picked you. I, I kind of figured he'd want to keep pushing on all night. Now, down gun, I. Oh, guy, along about this time, I just get tired. Huh? <laughs> As soon as the morning sun began gray in the sky, we started off again. Falk's trail was winding up the side of Eagle Mountain now. It was a pretty hard ride. Tom didn't complain, even though I could see he wasn't used to it. Every once in a while, he almost slid out of his saddle, but somehow he managed to hang on. About noon, we reached Little Creek, and Falk's trail gave out. The other trail, the one we figured was Hooker's, it sort of milled around in all directions and then went off on a tangent. And we climbed out from our horses and got a drink of water. Ah, yeah. It tastes good, doesn't it? <laughs> it sure does. You uh, ever been out this way before, Tom? Oh, yeah. Not for the last couple of years, though. Mm -hmm. Any cabins around, place a man could hide out? Well, not that I remember. You think we're getting close to him? Well, he could have gone on using the creek to cover his trail, but he'd have to stop pretty soon. No. Oh, yeah, a man can't keep riding forever. He, he can think Falk. So far, we haven't seen any signs that he made camp, you see. That's so. Giant cave. Hmm? He might be there, Britt. It's not more than a mile away, due south. Giant cave. Well, you've heard of it, ain't you? No, I no, don't think I have. Well, it'd be a perfect spot for a man to hold up. Nobody knows for certain just how far back into the mountain the cave really goes. Some scientific fellows tried to explore it last summer, but, well, their lanterns gave out before they come to the end. Uh-huh. Well, it sounds like something we ought to see even a fork in there. Come on, let's go and have a look. Oh, uh, that's the entrance there, Britt, beside that slab of yellow rock. Uh-huh. I don't see any sign of Falk's trail. I guess he could have come up from the other side, though. Yeah, that's what he must have done. Huh? That pony over on you. That clump of bushes he's grazing. Oh, well, yeah. Yeah, Sam. Easy, Scott. Sorrow. Easy, easy, war boy. You know, Jake Watson said Falk stole a sorrow when he made his getaway. Mm-hmm. Now well, we'd better close in on foot. We tethered our horses on a couple of spruce saplings and moved into the cave entrance. It wasn't a very big hole. We had to sort of bend over and crawl through it. But the room on the other side, I, it must have been 100 feet long, 50 feet wide. The walls were sheer rock, sort of rainbow colored, so smooth you'd have thought somebody had been polishing them. And then the light behind us got down to a pinpoint. He wouldn't be hiding here in the dark, would he, Britt? Maybe. He heard us coming. Shh. There's somebody up ahead. Yeah. You got your gun ready? Uh-huh. Now, don't use it unless you're pretty sure of hitting something. We start shooting, it'll just help his aim. Okay. All right, now back up against the wall here behind you. Falk! We know you're in here, Falk. You go any further, you'll get lost. You'll never find your way out. Hey, you hear me, Falk? <coughs> you're wasting lead. You can't see us. We know that. You can't see me, neither. We don't have to. 
You've got to come out sooner or later, and we'll be waiting. All right, we're going to leave you now, Buck. We're going outside and wait. Hey, where you are? You giving up? No, I ain't. And I ain't alone. What? I got somebody with me. Friend of yours, I reckon. We're coming out together. And if you try to stop me, I'll kill him. What's he talking about? He, he ain't lying, Brett. It, it's me, Spud Hooker. Spud. I, I caught up with him last night, but he, but he got the draw on me. Hold your fire, Brett. He means what he says. He'll kill me if you don't hold your fire. You've got to do what he told you, Brett. You've got to. All right, Bob, come on. Start backing up toward the entrance. I don't hear you moving. Brett, please. All right, let's go, Tom. We backed out into the daylight, Tom and me, and waited for them. About a minute later, Spud Hooker marched through the mouth of the cave, half scared to death. Dink Falk was right behind him, holding a forty-five, aimed at the smallest Spud's back. I was pretty sure he wouldn't hesitate to pull the trigger either. Sheriff Tinsmith was right. He's just a wildcat killer. He had that stampede look in his eyes as he stood there blinking against the sun. Same kind of a look you see in a steer when the herd's shoving him along. You can't stop or be trampled to death. Hang off your guns. Both of you. Take them off or I'll fix your friend here. Falk gave Spud a shove with his gun and he jumped forward. There was an opening now between him and Falk. The next thing I knew, Tom dived forward. Get out of Spud! Tom tackled Spud and he rolled over. No! The bullet missed him, but Tom was in range and he took it. Falk aimed to fire again and I managed to get my gun out. The bullet hit his thigh and spun him around. Then his leg buckled and he fell face down. He hadn't let go of the pistol yet. He started to bring it up. Drop it, Falk! For a second, his finger went right on squeezing the trigger, but... Nah, he just didn't have the strength. <sighs> Tom? Tom, you all right? <sighs> sure. Yeah, it's hardly bleeding. I... I should have let Falk alone. I should have let you handle him, Britt. Well, I don't know. Looks to me like Tom did most of the handling around here. I mean, if it hadn't been for him, yeah. You know, it's... I guess I had you figured wrong, Tom. I never thought you'd be the one to save me, but I wasn't saving you, Spud. Huh? I don't like you. I never did. And nothing's going to change that. Then why? I like Ellen. I like her a lot. Now, she's in love with you. If you got yourself killed, it would just hurt her and wouldn't do me no good. Ellen, tell you she's in love with me? She didn't have to. When she finds out what happened today... She ain't gonna find out. I'm gonna tell her. I'm gonna tell her myself. I don't want her to know. It's for me to decide. Now, listen here, Spud Hooker. You do the listening for a chance. No, I thought you I thought you were listening last now, night, but it looks now, like... No, no, no. Hold on, hold on now. Uh. Now, I think we ought to get Tom to a doctor, don't you? If we don't, Alan won't have no way of choosing him, even if she wanted to. Now, come on, Spud. Come on, give me a hand. Now, we tied Falk onto the back of his pony and started off for town. I sure didn't know what Alan was going to do about Spud and Tom. Oh, you never know what a woman's going to do when it comes to, you know, falling in love and marrying and all that sort of thing. But I did know one thing. Uh, that, that picking Tom to go along with me, I, I had been a pretty good choice. Alan probably could do a whole lot worse, you know. Ladies and gentlemen, the tradition of religious freedom and of religious worship in America goes back to the very founding of our country. So in these days of world crisis, when our nation and all its citizens need spiritual strength and guidance, all of us should think again of what religion means to us and to our country. 
for its religious faith that makes our way of life possible. During November, people of many faiths are joining in a great Religion in American Life campaign. So whatever your faith may be, you are asked to join in this campaign. Be sure to attend and support the church or synagogue of your choice. And if you have children, by all means, light their life with faith. Bring them to worship this week. The Six Shooter is an NBC Radio Network production in association with Review Productions. It is based on a character created by Frank Burt, and the transcribed story is written by him. Mr. Stewart may currently be seen in the Universal International picture Thunder Bay. Others in the cast were Jeanette Nolan, Frank Gerstel, Robert Griffin, Forrest Lewis, and Sam Edwards. Special music for this program was by Basilette, and the entire production is under the direction of Jack Johnstone. All characters and incidents were fictitious, and any resemblance to actual characters or incidents is purely coincidental. And incidentally, a great many of our friends have written in to thank us for putting the six-shooter on the air. And a surprising number of letters have requested the name of the theme you are listening to right now, and where it might be obtained. Well, we're sorry, but it is music that has been recorded exclusively for broadcast, and is therefore not available for home use. But we are grateful, nonetheless, to all of you who have written. Your kind letters are always welcome. This is Hal Gibney speaking. Tonight, here's Celeste Holm in the NBC Star Playhouse on the NBC Radio Network. In just a moment, you will hear James Stewart as the Six Shooter, just one of the many fine programs brought to you Sundays on NBC. Later this evening, listen to the NBC Star Playhouse with two of your favorite stars. Hear Stroke of Fate and the story of what might have happened if fate had reversed historical facts. And be sure to keep tuned for the dramatic story of The Last Man Out. It's a wonderful lineup of great programs, all of them heard only on NBC. James Stewart as the Six Shooter. The man in the saddle is angular and long-legged. His skin is sun-dyed brown. The gun in his holster is gray steel and rainbow mother of pearl, its handle unmarked. People call them both the Six Shooter. The NBC Radio Network presents James Stewart as The Six Shooter, a transcribed series of radio dramas based on the life of Britt Ponson, the Texas plainsman who wandered through the Western territories, leaving behind a trail of still remembered legends. <laughs> Short enough for you? Mm. I asked you if it was short enough for you. Well, give me the mirror so as I can take a look. Uh, there you are. Well? Don't look to me like you cut it at all. Oh, now, Al. Well, it's still there, ain't it? Hanging down the back of my neck. Well, I figured you'd want to be in style. Fellow's in just the other day, come from Kansas City. Said that's the way all Easterners are having a haircut. Well, I ain't no Easterner, and I don't aim to be spending a quarter every week for a shave and a haircut, so start slicing it off. Okay, okay. I need to get the head up. Oh, sorry, Breezy. I, I reckon I ain't feeling up to snuff today. Okay, say as I blame you. I heard about the town meeting last night. Yeah. You, uh, told him yet? I don't see why everybody's in such a rush all of a sudden. You waited 40 years, a couple more hours ain't gonna make no difference. You're, uh, gonna do it today then, huh? Yeah, I'm gonna do it today. Mm, poor old Gabe. Wonder how he'll take it. I'm sure glad it ain't me that has to break the news. Stop talking about it, Breezy, and finish my hair. Well, Gabe's a sensible man. He's not got hold again, you Alf. Seeing as how the, the whole town's agreed. Well, the whole town don't know him like I do. I was here when he first come to Yellow Crest. I don't know if it wasn't for Gabe Starbuck, there wouldn't be... Howdy, mister. Paul, you're next. It'll be a couple of minutes. 
Dodge City Papers there if you'd like to read it while you're waiting. Thank you. Nice. Brit, now you sit still. Brit puns it. Huh? Don't you remember me, Brit? Why, uh, I... Elf? Elf Crandall? Elf? Elf Crandall? Oh, oh, sure, I remember you. Well, what happened to your beard? Uh, Breezy here shaved it off three years ago. Oh, he did? <laughs> yeah. A couple of the boys paid him to do it while I was asleep in the chair. Is that so? Uh... I ain't never forgiven you for that, Breezy. You could have grown it back out. Well, it wouldn't have been the same. Took me 25 years to get that stand of whiskers. Besides, once Maddie seen me without them. <laughs> Folks do say I look younger. Well, you look so young, I hardly recognize you. That's... Well, what about you, Brett? How's the world been treating you? Oh, first rate, first rate. You just hit town. Yeah, yeah. I've been out on the Square Moon Ranch last month or so. I ran into a flock of sheep yesterday, and they gave me such a brotherly look, I decided it's high time I get a haircut. <laughs> <laughs> Be right pleased to take care of you, Mr. Ponsett. <laughs> yeah, there. That ought to be short enough, Al. Well, feels like you got some of it off anyhow. Uh, just let me give you a little brush. All right, there you go. Oh, thanks. Sit right down, Mr. Bronson. Uh, well, what'll it be? Shave and a haircut? Ah, uh, haircut'll do it. Well, you might as well have a shave, too, as long as you're here. I got the kettle on, the towels will be real hot. Why, you won't even feel the razor. No, no, I don't think No I'm matter right. how good a man is at shaving himself, it's not the same as having a barber do it. Oh, now, no, you take no. having a horse shod. You don't do that yourself unless it's oh, an emergency. No, oh. You go to an expert. That's well, sir, right, it seems to me right. a man's face ought to be as important as his horse. Yes, but it I, seems I, to me I, that right. when a fellow wants to get a... <laughs> all right, Brady, I, you can give me a shave, too. <laughs> yes, sir, Mr. Ponzi, yes, sir. I'll just trim some of this hair off while the water's warming up. You gonna be around town for a spell, Britt? Uh, just overnight, Al. I'm due back to Square Moon tomorrow. Well, I'd sure like to stay and chew the fat, but uh, I'm due over to Gabe's Starbucks office. Oh, say, how is he? Hmm? Gabe. Gee, I haven't seen higher in the tail of him. Must be over four years. Oh, that's uh, that's right. You and him used to be real good friends. Didn't oh, you? he sure did. It was Gabe Starbuck gave me my first pony. Well, as a matter of fact, he's he's aging, Brett. He's aging fast. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. He, he, he's not down sick. Is no, he? no, no. Gabe wouldn't let himself get down no matter how he felt. Uh huh. What's he up to nowadays? <sighs> Same as ever. Well, you. you you mean he's still sheriff? Yeah, he's, he's still sheriff. At least he is today. Oh? Truth is, we had a meeting just last night. Decided the town's got to have a new sheriff. And that's what I'm going over to talk to Gabe about now. Uh-huh. You don't want it too short, do you, Mr. Ponsett? The fellow was in from Kansas City the other day. Says back there folks ain't cutting their hair so short anymore. Well, you, says it, you better uh, trim it pretty close, Breezy. I may not be in a barbershop again for quite some time. You know? uh, whatever you say. There's many people around here don't want to be in style. Nobody wants to get rid of old Gabe Britt. The town's changed. Well, we got near 700 people living here now. That many? Yeah, there's a new bank, too. Maybe you saw Yes, I did, yes. Not doing very good, though. Folks are afraid their money won't be safe. Oh, we haven't had any robberies, not for quite a spell. As long as Gabe's sheriff, well, there's not much he could do to stop an outlaw if one did happen to come our way. You know, old Gabe being so old and all. Mm-hmm, yeah. Doggone it, Britt. We all realize that we owe him an awful lot. He cleaned up Yellowcrest, made it possible for decent people to live here. Of course, that was 40 years ago. Things are a lot different now. We, uh, we got to have us a new sheriff, that's all. Mm-hmm. Does Gabe know you're planning on replacing him? No, no, no. He told him yet, but can't put it off much longer. I see. It's going to hurt him pretty bad, isn't it? Well, how would you feel if it was your place? You give your life to a town, your whole life, and they say, we're, we're sorry, but we got to put you out to pasture. You're too old. Mm-hmm. Well, maybe, maybe if... He was to have a deputy. Well, we talked about that. Town ain't rich enough to afford two salaries. Mm -hmm. Well, Gabe's got a good, sensible head on his shoulders. That's what I said, Mr. Ponsett. That's just what I said. He probably won't like the idea of losing his job, not at first, but he'll he'll see that you don't have much choice in the thing. Now, you just lean back. That's better. Be sure and tell me if this towel's too hot. (laughs) Ooh. Ooh. A little warm? Well, I guess I can stand it. I'm real glad you don't think we're being too hard on Gabe, Brett. Say, 
gives me an idea. Well, well uh, seeing as how you understand the predicament we're in, uh, about Gabe, I mean, maybe you wouldn't mind sort of preparing him? <laughs> no, 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 wait, wait just a minute, Alf. I, 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 oh, I, now, your old friend, you said so yourself. It, it'll be different having the news come from you. No, it's not my concern. Uh, no. Here's another towel, Mr. Ponsett. Now, just lean back. <laughs> You're going to be seeing them anyway, Brett. Now, all you have to do is kind of lead the conversation around to him retiring, you know, lay the foundation, and then later on, when everything gets... I won't do it, Al. I won't do it. Now, you're just wasting your breath. You just... How in thunder am I going to get this lather on, Mr. Ponson, if you keep moving around like I'm that? I'm only asking you to talk to Gabe because, well, I, I have to say the wrong thing. You know me, Brett, always... Put my foot in my mouth. And I hold still. Uh, now, Al, I tell you, you're you're not gonna put. Ouch, ouch, ouch. Your, your own fault, Mister Ponson. Now I told you to keep quiet. Please, he's right. Just just sort of take it easy, Britt, while I sort of explain what I had in mind, and then if you still aren't willing. <laughs> well, between the shaving and the hot towels, and Al harping at me while I. Not that I agreed to tell Gabe that Tom's getting a new sheriff. I, I didn't agree to that, Nigel. But all I said was that I, I'd sort of feel him out and uh, see how the land was lying. Anyway, about 20 minutes later, I was coming along the boardwalk heading for Gabe's office. Huh. Well, it sure sounded like shooting to me. When I looked around, nobody seemed to be paying any attention. Listen to that. The fellows arguing politics over the post office steps, they didn't even stop to take a breath. And the ladies in Johnson's Mercantile, they went right on measuring yardage like they hadn't even heard it. Uh-huh. Well, I was pretty sure where it was coming from now. I was right behind the sheriff's office. Uh, opened the front door. No sign of Gabe. No sign of anybody, for that matter. And oh, oh, then I saw him right through the back window. And I saw why folks hadn't been very upset about the gunfire. Gabe was having himself a little target practice out there, aiming at a tin can sitting on a pile of lumber. It had just been four years since I'd seen him last, but oh, he looked good ten years older. Smaller, too. He kind of shrunk and bent over thin, yellow-gray hair and a long, bony arms that didn't seem to have much meat on them. Yeah. He sure wasn't having much luck hitting that tin can, either. Hello, Gabe. Hmm? Who? Who? No, it's Brett. Brett Parson. Oh, yeah. I'll be Well, it's sure good to see you. Yeah, for a second there, I didn't recognize you. His son got my eyes. I blinded me, son. Sure. Uh, how are you, Gabe? Well, never better. Never felt better in my life. Glad to hear it. Well, I... <laughs> I was just, um... Just doing a little shooting. Yeah, yeah, I saw you. Oh, not that I need any practice, you understand, Britt. I, but I was worried about one of my guns. I, I think it throws a little to the left. I say. Uh... Yeah, yeah, that's why I missed my last shot. Uh, um... <clears throat> In case you saw me, miss it. Oh, well, well, a man can't hit anything if his gun's not working. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, let's go inside where we can sit down and have us talk. Fine, fine. Yeah. yeah. Well, you're looking good, Red. Real good. Oh, well, a little older, maybe. But I guess that happens to all of us, doesn't it? <laughs> oh, I don't know. Man's only as old as he feels. Uh-huh. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Hey, just take that chair, Britt, over there. Oh, fine. Yeah. Uh, I'll sit by the window here. Where I can keep an eye out on the street. Yeah, yeah I uh, I was kind of surprised to hear that you're still sheriff, Gabe. Huh. Don't see why I should have surprised you. Well, you know, oh, you, you... You must be getting along, Gabe. Well, I'm 64, Britt. 64 this spring. Now, uh... Now, uh, Gabe. Well, might be 65. The family never kept no records. But I ain't no, no older than that. Uh, no... Don't look no older. No, no. Do I? Oh, no. No, no, no. Huh. You, uh, you still living alone? Well, of course I'm still living alone. You think I need a keeper or something? Oh, no. I, I was just wondering if you ever got a hold of that ranch you used to talk about. That's all. You remember? Ranch? Yeah, don't you remember that? When I was a kid, you always said someday you're going to have a ranch. After you'd retired from being sheriff, of course. Oh, oh, I still aim to do it. 
When the time comes, of course, there ain't no sense in thinking about it now. Oh. No, no. Yellowcrest is growing, but growing fast. That's when the town needs law and order the most. When it's busting its britches. And seeing as how I'm the only experienced lawman in these parts, well, it's my duty to stay on the job. I owe it to the folks here. Why, if I was even to think about retiring, well, they just wouldn't know what to do. They'd be plumb helpless. Well, I ain't got no choice, Britt. You know how it is. Sure, sure, Gabe. I, uh... Yeah, I, I know. We'll return to James Stewart as the six-shooter in just a moment. The winter brings extra hazards to the motorist and the pedestrian. Longer hours of darkness, poor visibility caused by snow, rain and fog, and slippery streets call for extra caution. The National Safety Council urges that for safety, every motorist should always adjust speed to road and weather conditions. Keep the windshield clear. Never slam on your brakes if the road is wet or slippery. Pump them slowly to slow down or stop. Use tire chains on snow and ice, and keep a safe distance between your car and the one ahead. Guard against that one accident that might take your life or ruin it. Now, Act Two of The Six Shooter, starring James Stewart as Britt Ponsett. sitting there in the office watching the wagons creak along outside the window. I guess we've about covered everything. Folks we'd known old times. The only thing we didn't discuss was Gabe's return from sheriff. Anyhow, after I left him, I had supper and took a little stroll. Oh, it must have been about nine o'clock when I got settled down for the night in my room in the Parker Hotel. The bed was real comfortable, a lot softer than those bunks out at Square Moon Ranch. Maybe that's why I had so much trouble dropping off to sleep. Yeah? Yeah, who is it? Alec Randall. You sleep, Brent? Oh, no, no. Come on in, Al. Oh, come on in. I'll just get this lamp turned up. Here. There we are. I didn't mean to wake you. Ned Parker told me you only turned in a few minutes ago. Yeah, I'll pull up the chair. Thanks. You know, I was looking for you this evening after supper. Well, I went for a walk. Oh? You were right, Alf. The yellow crest sure has changed. That's a fine new church going up there by the creek. Uh... Yeah. Well, what I wanted to find out a bit was uh, whether you talked to Lots of new about... buildings over south, too. Mighty fancy houses. Some of them look like they're going to be two stories high. Great. Right. Yeah. How'd he take it? Why, uh, how did he take what? Uh, oh, you mean Gabe? Well, who else would I mean? Well? Well, I didn't tell him, Alf. Huh? I told you I couldn't do it. I, well, when I, I, I just couldn't do it. I don't blame you, Britt. I shouldn't have asked you in the first place. It was my job. I did kind of hit around once or twice, but I could see what it did to him. I just, just the idea of not being sheriff anymore is... It's all he's got, Alf. He doesn't have a family and kids to worry about. Gabe's the sheriff at Yellowcrest, and if he ever stops being the sheriff, he he won't be anything. I know, Britt. I know, but what can we... What, what's that? The alarm bell. Must be a fire, I reckon. There's Mark Fawcett running down the street there. He'll know. Oh, gone his window. Stuck tighter. Mark! Mark, up here, Mark! What are they ringing the bell for? Somebody robbed the bank! The bank? We're meeting over at the sheriff's office. Well, I guess it was bound to happen sooner or later, Britt. Yeah. Hand me my pants, will you? The bell was still ringing when Alf and I rode up to Gabe's office. 
Everybody in town has heard of by now. There were 10 or 12 men standing around the streets, others coming up from all directions. Gabe was standing right by his horse, right in the middle of things, taking charge. Well, there wasn't much doubt about it. He was still Good sheriff of the yellow crest. Back. Really? Uh, you boys know Britt Barnes, don't you? Oh, yeah. Now, what, what happened, Gabe? Well, it was just an accident. I seen him. An accident, pure and simple. They was riding out of the alley from behind the bank, giving the horses a spur. Couldn't get a look at their faces, but the way they was riding, that made me suspicious. Uh-huh. So I thought maybe I ought to see if everything was all right at the bank. Went around to check. Back door was broke open, wide open. People are scattered around inside. Uh, Jim Waterby's over there now, trying to find out how much they took. Oh. Didn't try to follow them, the outlaws. Well, they was gone before I knew there was outlaws. Uh, before I knew for certain, that is. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I seen which way they're headed. East. Oh. 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 Uh, that don't make sense, Jay. They'd have to cross the salt flats if they went east. Sure they were. That's the way they went. Right toward the flats. Well, you must have been a seeing things. Man to be a fool to strike out that way. Sure, well. 200 miles without a water hole. Oh, I bet you turned off, went up in them hills. Well, I'm the one who's seen them, ain't I? Yeah, $2,500, Gabe. That's what they stole. Oh, that's so, Jim. Sure, well, a sack of gold and a sack of currency. Yeah. 2500 is as close as I can figure it. Yeah, boys. Let's see if we can pick up the trail. Easy, Rusty, easy. Ooh, uh, They'll determine to chase him out onto them flats. Yeah, right? we want to catch him, don't we? Uh, sure. If we do, we got to use our heads, Gabe. Men smart enough to rob that bank ain't going to take a chance on dying out there in that salt. They'd go for the hills. Mark yeah. is right, Gabe. Yeah. Yeah. You tell me I can't believe my own eyes. Well, it was pretty dark. Maybe you got confused. Maybe it looked like they was heading east. Now, we're only wasting time arguing with him. Let's go. Yeah. I'm the sheriff of Yellow Crest. I'm running this posse, ain't I? Gabe, we're, uh, we're riding toward the ridge. All right. Come on, Rusty. Come on. Oh, Gabe. Hey, Gabe. Uh, you can't stop him, Brett. When he gets his mindset, nobody can stop him. Guess this just proves we was right about Gabe. He ain't up to the job of being sheriff no more. Yeah, yes, you're right, sure. Okay, boys, I'll lead the way. Yeah. Hey, sir, come on, this Brett. Oh, you've got enough man without me. Search yourself. I watched them wind along toward the rise of the purple hills west of town. After a couple of minutes, the night swallowed them up, and the hoofbeats trickled off in the silence. All right, Scar, come on. I turned Scar east. It wasn't like Gabe to be stubborn about something as important as a bank robbery. Oh, I'll grant you, it didn't seem very sensible for a couple of bandits to take off across the salt flats. And Gabe's eyesight wasn't what it had been once, of course. But I just couldn't believe he'd he'd be dead wrong. And Scar threw up his head when the smell of salt hit his nose. <laughs> he sure didn't like the idea of walking out into it. Easy, boy. Easy now. Easy now. We're not going very far. Come on. Come on now. Nothing but white, as far as you could see. Stretch out taunt like a cavalry blanket. White saw picking up the moonlight and bouncing it along ahead of us. The funny thing, though, there, there was only one set of hoof prints out there on the flats. Well, about ten minutes later, I spotted Gabe. Oh, boy. Oh, oh boy. He wasn't riding very fast, so I slowed up. I figured it was just as well Gabe didn't see me. I, I didn't want him to think that I'd tagged along because I was worried about him, you know. And then the darndest thing happened. He swung his horse around and started backtracking. Here, boy. Here, boy. Come on. I eased Scar over behind a couple of gray boulders so we'd be out of sight. And Gabe came right toward us. At first, I thought he knew where we were. Then he turned his horse again and walked him out in the saw. For a couple of minutes, I couldn't figure out what he was up to. It seemed to me like he was just wandering around, no purpose at all. And then the next thing that happened, it was even stranger yet. Gabe jerked his gun out of his horse and he began firing. He wasn't aiming at anything. He, he, as far as I could see, he was just shooting up into the sky. Yeah, he left off two or three more shots and wheeled around and galloped past me on, on his way back to town. And I saw him reach in his saddlebags and bring out a couple of cloth sacks and hook them over his saddle horn. They were the kind of sacks banks used for carrying money. Yeah. Well, there just wasn't any doubt about it now. The story of that bank robbery was something Gabe had made up out of whole cloth. Oh. 
Oh, somebody had broken into the bank, all right. Well, it wasn't an outlaw, though. It was Gabe. <laughs> well, well I, I waited all oh, maybe 15 minutes. And then I, I heard the alarm bell start off again. The posse would pull up in front of Gabe's office. The bell must have brought him out of the hills. Gabe was handing the cloth sacks to Jim Waterby. I pulled up just in time to hear the tail end of what he was saying. I ain't sure I hit him, you understand. This gun of mine's been thrown a bit to the left lately. But when I started shooting, they dropped these here bags and went galloping off. By the time I stopped to pick up the money, I reckon that's what's in them. Well, them outlaws was just plumb out of sight. Yes, sir. I figure there wasn't much need of chasing them no further. Like as not, they'll never make it cross us all anyway. Now, you did right, Gabe. Yeah. And it looks like it's all here. Every cent. Hey, <laughs> Rich! Rich, you hear what happened? Gabe caught up with the bandits, shot it out with them, and brung back what they stole. Did he? Yeah. Ah, uh, don't seem possible. I'm having a head start and all. Well, you know Rusty when I give him his head. Well, maybe the bandits was lost. Maybe they didn't know about them flats. Yeah, I reckon they didn't. I reckon that's it. Uh, if they knew where the bank was, they'd know about that salt. Oh, that's yeah, right. That's right. That's right. Uh, what are you getting at, Mark? I don't know. There's something funny about this. There's two of them, you said, huh? That's right. Two of them against you? Well, what's so funny about that? Many's the time I shot it out with more than two men. Let's ride out there, boys, and have a look around. Well, whatever you say, Mark. Sure. Uh, 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 hold on a minute. I think maybe I can save you a trip. Huh? Uh, yeah, the, the fact is, I was following Gabe. Oh, what? Yeah, I, I followed him right on, out onto the flats. And... What? Oh, I, I know you didn't see me, Gabe. I was behind you, but I could see you just plain as day. Now, now, now Britt, you got to let me... You mean you've seen the gunfight, too? Now, listen to me, Britt, listen to me. Uh, was he telling the truth, Britt? Yeah, that's right, was he? Well, I'll tell you one thing. I never saw a fight like that before, not in my whole life. Yeah. Yeah. What about the bandits, Britt? You get a chance to recognize them? No, 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 I'm afraid I didn't. You didn't stick around, eh? Once Gabe started shooting? No, no, I, uh... Well, uh, as a matter of fact, when Gabe was through shooting, well, it was like they hadn't even been there. No. I'll be, I'll be darned. Mm-hmm. That's... That's what it was, all right. Just... Like they hadn't been there at all. I don't know how Gabe had found out that the town was talking about having a new sheriff. I guess he sort of sensed it, the way folks have been acting. Of course, after this, this hold up, well, they figured out maybe they could afford giving him a deputy. Jim Waterby, that, that's the banker. He put up part of the money, and then they, they didn't have much trouble raising the rest. I had a little talk with Gabe just before I left town. We, we didn't mention that night out on the flats, neither one of us. But he, he did give me his word that the next time there was any trouble, well, he, he'd, uh, he'd let his deputy do a good share of taking care of it. But the, the way things worked out, though, there haven't been any more robbers in Yellow Crest. Not one single solitary robbery. They, they say it's because of Sheriff Gabe. Outlaws just don't want to tangle with him. They all must have heard about what happened that time a couple of them tried to hold up the Yellow Crest Bank. I wonder if you really know how much good you're doing every time you buy Christmas seals. Well, let me tell you something. Something I think will amaze you. It's simply this. Over six million lives have been saved in the fight against tuberculosis since the first Christmas seal was sold. In other words, what you actually buy when you buy Christmas seals is priceless protection for yourself, your family, and your community. So, please answer your Christmas seal letter today. The Six Shooter is an NBC Radio Network production in association with Review Productions. It is based on a character created by Frank Burt, and the transcribed story is written by him. Mr. Stewart may currently be seen in the Universal International picture, The Glenn Miller Story. 
Others in the cast were Herb Bygren, John Stevenson, Lamont Johnson, Dal McKinnon, and Old Gabe was played by Bill Johnstone. Special music for this program was by Basil Adlam, and the entire production is under the direction of Jack Johnstone. All characters and incidents were fictitious, and any resemblance to actual characters or incidents is purely coincidental. And now, from all of us who each week bring you The Six Shooter, a special salute to NBC affiliated station WGBF Evansville, Indiana, on the occasion of their 30th anniversary. Happy anniversary, WGBF, and best wishes to all of your listeners. This is Hal Gipney speaking. Tonight, hear Lily Palmer and Rex Harrison in the NBC Star Playhouse on the NBC Radio Network. Well, I hope you're enjoying the compilation so far. I just wanted to break in for a minute. I'm like the old-time announcers. Now, I don't have any Petri wine or anything like that, but I do want to ask you to consider clicking the link below, and maybe, if you've enjoyed tonight's show, maybe buy us a strawberry. Strawberry. You what? I think it's a strawberry. Whoa, whoa, whoa. whoa. You want strawberries? I need strawberries. You want strawberries, please? I need more. (laughs) Empty. You need more? You're empty. (laughs) Please, folks. The strawberries are empty. We need more strawberries. Don't blow their ears up. Some of them are trying to sleep. Okay. (laughs) Thanks for joining us, Ellie. (laughs) (laughs) Bye-bye. (laughs) Bye-bye. As you can see, the strawberry situation here is very desperate. So consider clicking the link below and buying us a strawberry. And while you're there, maybe check out the Johnny Dollar Club, either on Patreon or buy me a coffee. For only a dollar a month, you can help keep this channel going strong on YouTube. So thanks so much for being a part of the Hearth and Home family. moment you'll hear James Stewart as the six shooter just one of the many fine programs brought to you Sundays on NBC listen to the NBC star playhouse with Frederick March and Florence Eldridge hear stroke of fate and what might have happened if fate had reversed historical facts and keep tuned for the dramatic story of last man out it's a lineup of great programs all of them heard only on NBC James Stewart as the six shooter. The man in the saddle is angular and long legged. His skin is sun dyed brown. The gun in his holster is gray steel and rainbow mother of pearl, its handle unmarked. People call them both the six shooter. The NBC Radio Network presents James Stewart as The Six Shooter, a transcribed series of radio dramas based on the life of Britt Ponsett, the Texas plainsman who wandered through the Western territories, leaving behind a trail of still-remembered legends. The snow was beginning to melt by the time I reached Dawson. You could hear it dripping from the eaves, hitting the boardwalk along the main street. I'd figured on being in town a couple of days earlier, but that storm sort of threw me off schedule. Not that I had to be there any particular day, but my winter job at Dave Engelman's ranch would be waiting for me whenever I showed up. But the sooner I got to Dave's, the sooner we could start moving his herd down to lower ground. Oh, Scott. Oh, oh boy. Well, I... It was almost noon, so I tied Scar to the hitching rail in front of Brick Vining's gambling hall and went hunting a place to eat. The town was sort of showing a little wear and tear. Of course, Dawson never had been a rich place, and I guess the drought last summer hadn't helped much. Folks just didn't have the money for improving the real estate, that's all. Except the jail. Huh. Gee, for, for a minute, I couldn't believe my eyes. Well, it was all fixed up. Fresh green paint on the outside, new wooden steps leading up to the front door. 
real honest to goodness barge in the cell windows. Uh, it sure was a different jail, all right. But the face grinning out at me from behind those cast iron bars, well, <laughs> that face hadn't changed a bit since the last time I was in Dawson. <laughs> Howdy, Brett. Hello, Mel. <laughs> I heard you was coming to town. Dave Engelman said you signed up with him. Yeah, that's right. You, uh, you in for something, Mel? You... <laughs> oh, there's a little ruckus over at Brick Fighting's place last night. Some folks said I started it. Uh-huh. Mm. Reckon they're right. You do. Uh, mm. uh, uh, seems to me like you were in jail when I left Dawson a couple of years back, isn't oh, it? Uh, was it uh, Saturday night or Sunday morning? Uh, could have been. Could have been. I don't remember exactly. Well, if it was a Saturday night or Sunday morning, like as not, I was here. I ain't miss being thrown in more than two Saturday nights and say for us build a place. Mm-hmm. Well, at least you're living in style. I, George, this jail looks a lot fancier than it used to be. Yes, yes. New sheriff fixed it all up. New sheriff, huh? Sure. Oh, you heard about Saul Gordon being killed, didn't you? No. No, well, what happened? Oh, well, it happened, oh, maybe a couple of months ago. And, well, come on inside and have a look around while I tell you about it. Well, I don't know about that, Mel. You know, maybe the new sheriff wouldn't oh, care about it. Oh, Sheriff Billy wouldn't mind. He'd like you to pay us a visit. Now, come on, come on, Brett. The front door is unlocked. Well, all right, all right. Oh, <laughs> well, that's some desk, ain't it? Solid mahogany. He had it shipped here all the way from Frisco. Is that so? Mm-hmm. He paid for it out of his own pocket, too, Billy did. Town couldn't afford a desk like that. Oh, no, no. I don't suppose it could. Well, what about Saul? What, what what happened to him? Well, like I said, it was around two months ago. The Baxter brothers had been seen heading this way from White Eagle. When Sheriff Gordon heard about it, he, well, he got some men together and started looking for them. Mm-hmm. Young Billy hadn't been in town very long. He wasn't obliged to join the posse, but he went anyway. Billy Riddle. Oh, uh, that's his name, Britt. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Well, it wasn't a very big posse, and when one of them Baxter shot the sheriff, well, that'd have been the end of it. If Billy hadn't have took charge. Why, he managed to get off a couple of shots, and the next thing you know, both of them Baxter boys surrendered. <laughs> so when Billy came back to town, well, nobody else was very anxious for the job of sheriff, so he seemed to be the logical man for it. You know, the way he handled the posse and all. Sure, Of course, sure. some of the folks thought he was a little young for the job. Can't be more than 22 or 23, but he's got a good, firm grip on himself. He does. Uh, oh, he ought to be showing up about now. He always turns me loose in time for my Sunday dinner. Real nice young fella. you like him. Mm, a southern boy. Oh? Yeah, I don't know why he came out west exactly. Good thing for the town he did, though. Oh, howdy, Sheriff, howdy. Oh, we're just talking about you. This here is Britt, uh, Britt Ponsett. Ponsett? Oh, that's right. You've heard of him, ain't you? He's six shooter. Oh, sure. Sure. Pleased to meet you, Mr. Ponson. Howdy, Sheriff. I uh, just strolling by and Milt asked me to come inside. Oh, glad uh, you did. Well, Milt, I reckon you'd like to be on your way. Oh, I don't know, Sheriff. This jail's getting to be a darn sight more comfortable than my cabin. What with all your improvements? Well, if you want to stay... Oh, uh, on second thought, I, I'd better be getting home now. Thanks, thanks thank for the hospitality of your <laughs> Don't mention it. Uh, uh, you heading my direction, Brad? Uh, well, I'd, if, I've... Uh, you don't mind, Mr. Ponsett. I'd like to talk to you. Just for a couple of minutes. Sure, sure. Well, so long, then. See you next Saturday, sure. <laughs> sure, sure. <laughs> Goodbye, Mel. <Mel's. laughs> uh... I trust I'm not keeping you from anything, sir. No, no. No, I was just thinking about eating a little dinner, maybe, if there's a cafe open. Old Cotton serves a pretty good meal on Sunday. That's Cotton all? White, yeah. The place is right around the corner. Fine, fine. Well, I'll give that a try. You you wouldn't care to join me, would you? We could talk while we're eating. That is, if you don't have any other plans. Oh, thanks, Mr. Ponsett. I'd like to join you. You see, I'd been hoping you'd turn up in Dawson. <laughs> George, I'm, I'm sure was a nice tender pot roast, wasn't it? Mm-hmm. Oh, but oh, I ate too much, so I, huh? I, I, my belt's cutting into me like a cinch here. Wait a minute. 
What, uh, what was it you had in your mind, Billy? My name's Riddle, Mr. Parson. Bill Riddle. Uh-huh, yeah, Bill told me. Uh, the name doesn't mean anything to you? No, no, not offhand. I heard a lot about you, Mr. Ponce, since I came to Dawson. Folks say you've traveled a lot around this part of the country. Covered it all from one end to the other. Boy, well, I've done my share of moving about. Uh, what I wanted to know was if you ever ran into anybody else with the same last name as me. Riddle? Blake Riddle. Uh, that's the full name. Uh, relative? My father. Oh, oh. It's not a very common name. If you heard it, you'd be likely to remember it. Yes, yes. Here's your pie, Jeff. But watch that plate, though. It's hot. Thanks, God. No, no, I don't think I ever heard that name before. Well, I I wanted to be sure. Was your your father in these parts? Uh, I don't know. I know he was once. Uh, not here in Dawson, but somewhere in this territory. Mm-hmm. You haven't heard from him lately? No. No, I've never heard from him. Oh. Uh-huh. Fact of the matter is, I, I've never even seen him. You see, he brought my mother out west here before I was born. It wasn't the kind of life she'd been used to. She was born and raised in the South. The family had a plantation. I see. In those days, the frontier must have been pretty wild. Anyway, when it came time for me to be born, she went back home. And your father didn't go with her? No. Uh-huh. Maybe they had a quarrel. Maybe he didn't like her leaving him. I, I don't know. Uh-huh. Later on, she, she told me he was dead. But I found out that wasn't true. At least it wasn't true when she told me. Oh? Uh-huh. Anyhow, my mother died last year. In her things was a letter from Dad. It had been mailed from Denver about 15 years ago. Said he was going to buy a ranch somewhere around Phoenix. He asked Mother to bring me along and meet him. From the way it was written, you could kind of tell he didn't expect her to come. Yeah, yeah. Well, some folks don't bear up very well when they're transplanted, you know. They take root in one place, and there's no point in trying to move. Yeah, I reckon they just weren't suited. But now, well, I, I thought maybe if Dad was still alive, I, I thought maybe he and I... <sighs> Tell you the truth, Mr. Ponson, I guess I'm his son even though I never saw him. More his than Mother's. I see. And ever since I can remember, I've wanted to come west, even before I knew about him. And I've been happy out here, too, happier than I've ever been in my life. Of course, I didn't figure on being sheriff. That was uh, just an accident. Well, be that as it may, you're the sheriff, and Milt says you're a darn good one, so you at least got one satisfied customer. <laughs> I'm going to try, Mr. Ponson. I'm going to try hard. I just wish that Dad... Well, if you should ever run into him, why... Well, sure, sure. What, what the Sam hell is that? Sounds like somebody's getting frisky. There he goes, Sheriff. Over by the mercantile. Yeah. yeah he, oh, he ain't doing no harm. He's just shooting up in the air that way. He ain't doing no good either. Looks like he's running out of lead. Uh, yes, yes, uh, there he goes. Into Brick Binding's place. I put the dinners on my bill, Cotton. I'll pay you for them later. Sure, Sheriff. So, uh, hold up a minute, Billy. Yeah? Hey, uh, didn't you recognize that fellow, the one's doing the shooting? What? No. Why should I? Well, his name is Ben Reed. Reed? You sure, Mr. Ponson? Yeah, yeah, I'm sure. I I thought he was in jail over at Fort Lyon. I thought the marshal arrested him last month. Well, Ben Reed's been in a lot of jails, but he always sort of manages to break out somehow, you know. He won't break out of mine. You gonna arrest him, Sheriff? He's an outlaw, ain't he? Why, sure, sure, but... He's mighty fast with a gun. At least so I hear. Hey, ain't that right, Mr. Ponsett? Yeah, yeah, that's what folks say. Well, I guess there's only one way to find out. <laughs> Sheriff Billy was young, all right. But he didn't walk young. And he didn't swagger. He just moved ahead like a man who knew where he was going. Of course, Ben, a few years older, wouldn't have done him any harm, especially if he was going to tangle with Ben Reed. And Well, well, there, there didn't seem to be any reason for me to miss all the excitement, so I started off in the direction of the gambling hall. If young Bill didn't know what he was doing, well, he, 
and soon find out. Ben Reed was sitting at a poker table dealing the cards. He didn't even look up when Bill came over and stood beside him. But Ben knew somebody was there, and he knew whoever it was was wearing a star. He laid the deck of cards on the table, and he rested his left hand on his knee. Gee whiz, I sure hope Billy knew that Ben was left-handed. Your name's Reed? Ben Reed? You talking to me? I asked if you're Ben Reed. Yeah, I'm Reed. You broke out of jail over at Fort Lyon. Don't look like I'm still there, does it, Sonny? And you're going back. Oh. You're under arrest. I heard this town got themselves a new sheriff. Some youngster wasn't even dry behind the ears. Get on your feet. Sure. You know, most fellas your age never have a lot to live for. They'd be sort of careful who they started ordering around, but uh, maybe you're different. Maybe I am. What's your name, kid? Just for the record, I always like to know a man's name before I... Before there's any trouble. Bill Riddle. Sheriff Bill Riddle. Give me a gun, Reed. I said, give me a gun. For a couple of minutes, they stood there. Not moving, staring at each other. And Ben Reed's left hand slid down his hip a couple of inches. And in spite of myself, I found my own hand going for my holster. And then Ben's fingers stopped. And I, I, I couldn't believe my eyes. He unbuckled his gun belt and let it drop on the floor. Well, I guess the only person in that room who wasn't surprised was Billy. He just picked up those guns. He nodded to the door. Ben didn't even look back. He marched right out into the street and Billy behind him. Uh, it was a minute or so before it sank in. Just what had happened. Sheriff Billy Riddle had arrested Ben Reed without even drawing his gun. <laughs> return to James Stewart as the six shooter in just a moment. Ladies and gentlemen, your attention please. I've got $100, 100 genuine United States dollars and they're yours for a mere 75. Well, friends, suppose you heard an offer like that. You'd jump at it fast, wouldn't you? Well, that's the very offer I'm making you today. I'm promising a guaranteed return of $4 for every $3 you invest. And all you do is buy United States savings bonds. So sign up today for the payroll savings plan where you work or the bond a month plan where you bank. You'll feel more secure tomorrow if you buy United States savings bonds today. Now, Act Two of The Six Shooter. Starring James Stewart as Britt Ponsett. About two o'clock that Sunday afternoon, the snow started coming down again. Big, real big, heavy snow. So I left Scar at the livery stable and got myself a room at Mrs. Kramer's boarding house. Yeah, I sure didn't like the idea of going out for supper, but Mrs. Kramer said that she didn't fix food on Sunday night. She she was lead soprano in the church choir, and rain or snow, she had to be there for the evening service. There wasn't anybody else who could carry the melody. So I put on just about all the clothes I had with me and headed for Cotton White's Cafe. Howdy, Mr. Ponson. <sighs> oh, cheer <sighs> is coming down, ain't it? Yeah. We don't yeah. usually get a big snow like this before January or That's maybe so. February. Mm-hmm. Gee, like the weather's changing. I wonder what's causing it. I don't know, Cotton. Don't know. 
Ah, I, I was afraid you might be closed. No, I would be, except for these lunches I'm packing. Hmm? Yeah, the sheriff caught me just as I was locking the door. Oh? The idea of leaving for Fort Lyon in a blizzard like this. Fort Lyon? That's where he says he's going. Well, what for? He wants to turn Ben Reed over to the marshal there. He's sure in a big hurry to get rid of him for some reason. This don't make sense. Oh. Hmm. Like it's not, they'll never make it to Lyon, either one of them. But Billy says they're starting tonight, so... Yeah. Ah, well, no, that does it. Oh, I'll just run these over to jail. You can pour yourself a cup of coffee, Mr. Potts. I'll be right back. Well, why not let me take them over for you, Carter? Says I'm I'm all bundled up and everything. Oh, of course not, Mr. Potts. No Potter. trouble, no trouble. Besides, I'd kind of like to have a talk with Bill before he leaves town. Well, if you're sure. And, and don't stay open for me. I'll just get a cup of coffee from Mrs. Crane. That, 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 that's all I wanted anyway. Good night. Good night, Mr. Thanks for bringing them over, Mr. Ponson. Good night. Hey, Billy, mm-hmm. you, uh, you serious about striking out for Fort Lyon tonight? Yeah. Well, it looks to me like he's as safe here as he would be anywhere else. Guess he don't appreciate my company. That's right. I don't. Mm-hmm. Well, you're the sheriff. Yeah. Now, Fort Lyon's a two-day ride in good weather. You know, no telling how long it'll take you to get in a storm like this. Don't worry about that. Hmm. Was well, something happened, Billy? I don't know what you mean. Well, I... I guess it's none of my business, whatever it is. No, it isn't. Mm-hmm. Um, sorry, Mr. Ponsett, I... Oh, what's the use? Somebody will find out sooner or later... I'm not taking him to Fort Lyon. As soon as we get out of town, I'm going to turn him loose. What? And I'm not coming back to Dawson. I'm going home to Georgia, where I belong. Well, I suppose you've got your reasons. I told you. I only came out here to find my father. And I told you this was my lucky day. I found him. Of course, he wasn't quite what I expected. He's a thief, an outlaw, and a killer. You mean Reed? You knew it too, didn't you? No. No, I didn't know anything of the kind. Well, you must have guessed it then. When he let me take him without lifting a finger to stop me, you said yourself he was fast with a gun. Well, that's, I said that's what I heard. But the fact a man lets another man arrest him, well, that doesn't necessarily prove kinship. You I, know. I got the proof right here. What? It's a mighty pretty locket. Open it up. Huh? Ron, open it. That's my mother's picture when she was a girl. It's copied from a picture that hangs in our parlor back home. And he was carrying it fastened to his gun belt. That's all, Reed? His name isn't Reed. It's Blake Riddle. He's loco, Ponce. And ask anybody. I'm Ben Reed. I always have been. You're a fool to lie about it. If you want Blake Riddle, you'd be going to prison. I've been in prison before. And because you think he's your father, you're going to turn him loose. Is that it, Billy? I don't care about him or anything that happens to him. But she loved him once. At least she must have thought she did. And afterwards, you're getting out of town, huh? I don't reckon Dawson would have much use for a sheriff who was Ben Reed's kid. Well, they wouldn't have to know. I'd know it. I'd always know it. Even if they didn't. Well, the town was mighty proud of you, Billy. Well, at least I won't be the first lawman who couldn't hang on to Ben Reed. No. No, no, that's true enough. It just seems to me you're acting on mighty flimsy evidence. It seems to me there's a lot of ways a man could get a hold of a locket like this one. I wouldn't necessarily follow that he really belongs to him. Of course, if Reed says it's his... I it's... ain't said that. He never asked me. I didn't have to ask. Well, what about it, Reed? Where'd you get it? I had it so long, I almost forgot. Yeah. But it all come back to me when you was making such a fuss. <laughs> Never thought a piece of junk like that had caused so much stir. Go on. I, I, I found it. 
Oh, it must be about 15 years ago now, maybe more. I was down around Phoenix, a little town named uh, Court City. There were some other boys with me, and folks sort of got the idea we'd held up the bank, come looking for us with a posse. Well, there was a couple hours of shooting, and afterwards the posse went back without us. Those that were still alive, that is. What's all this got to do with Well, I'm finished, though. Well, we, we uh, went out to look at the bodies, you know, just to make sure the fellows were dead. One of them was carrying that locket, so I... Uh... Are you trying to say you killed my father? I don't know who killed him. Not for certain. We was all shooting. I, I suppose it could have been me. You're lying. You're lying. Well, why should he lie? If it's the truth, why did he keep that locket? Wasn't worth anything. Didn't have any value. Well... Why'd he keep it? I, I'll tell you, kid. When when I opened it up and looked at it, I, I said to myself, now, nah, she's pretty nice looking. So I thought seeing as how the fellow who was carrying the locket was sort of out of action, and maybe someday I might run into the woman in person having her picture, it sort of uh, give me an excuse. You to... filthy rotten, I'd have kill you, I'd have kill you with my bare hands. Bella, Bella, get hold of yourself. How could I ever have thought that a dirty, rotten killer would be my own? I must have been crazy, plumb crazy. You sure were. <laughs> The idea of a kid of mine turned out to be a sheriff. It took Billy Riddle a little while to simmer down. When he finally did, he changed his mind about going to Fort Lyon. He decided to wait until the storm had died down until he was sure of delivering the prisoner. Reed didn't say anything, not another word. Not until Bill went out back Get some wood for the pot bellied stove. Why are you looking at me like that, Ponson? Yeah, you didn't believe me, did you? Not entirely, Ray. No, not entirely. Why not? Well, for one thing, I. I was in Court City when you robbed that bank, and it wasn't 15 years ago. It was about four years ago. And the posse that went out after you, well, they didn't even get close to you. They came back, and all of them hadn't fired a shot. Well. And there was another, uh, I think you would call it discrepancy. What's that? I knew all those boys in that posse, and none of them was named Riddle. Well, one thing was true enough. The important thing. Oh? His father is dead. And I killed him. Why? Twenty years ago, when his mother went off and left me, when she wouldn't come back, when she wouldn't even answer my letters, that's when I killed the man his father had been. I didn't think I had anything to live for. I didn't think I'd ever see Billy. I didn't think I'd ever see him as long as I lived. That's when I turned out law and became Ben Reed. That's well, when I killed Blake Riddle. Mm-hmm. Yeah, maybe so. Maybe so. But as far as I'm concerned, there's a lot more of Blake Riddle here tonight than there is of Ben Reed. At least that's the way it appears to me. Well, it was a couple of days before that storm let up and Sheriff Billy could take him over to the marshal at Fort Lyon. And he got him there, too. No trouble at all. Of course, a lot of folks said that afterwards Ben Reed would just break out of jail again like he always had before. But, you know, so far he hasn't even tried to. It's, uh, people just don't understand it. He, he's, uh, now he, he's practically a mortal prisoner. <clears throat> Within the next five years, millions of additional children will crowd the elementary schools. Unless we prepare for this increased enrollment, our children and our nation will suffer. If America is to provide enough teachers and enough classrooms so that our children can receive a decent education, we must take immediate steps to improve some of our local school systems. Join and work with local civic groups and school boards actively seeking to improve educational conditions, won't you? Because better schools make better communities. The Six Shooter.
Computer is an NBC Radio Network production in association with Review Productions. It is based on a character created by Frank Burt, and the transcribed story is written by him. Mr. Stewart may currently be seen in the Universal International picture, The Glenn Miller Story. Others in the cast were James McCallion, Ken Christie, Howard McNear, and Alan Reed. Special music for this program was by Basil Adlam, and the entire production is under the direction of Jack Johnstone. All characters and incidents were fictitious, and any resemblance to actual characters or incidents is purely coincidental. This is Hal Gibney speaking. Tonight, hear Frederick March and Florence Eldridge in the NBC Star Playhouse on the NBC Radio Network. James Stewart as the Six Shooter. The man in the saddle is angular and long-legged. His skin is sun-dyed brown. The gun in his holster is gray steel and rainbow mother of pearl. Its handle unmarked. People call them both the six shooter. The NBC Radio Network presents James Stewart as the six shooter, a transcribed series of radio dramas based on the life of Britt Ponsett, the Texas plainsman who wandered through the Western territories, leaving behind a trail of still remembered legends. <laughs> The last place I expected to be that Tuesday was the town of Powder Creek. The Double G Ranch where I'd been working was clear on the other side of the territory, and you're oh, about 200 miles away. But when Sam Griffith, he's the owner of the Double G, when Sam got a chance to buy off Forrest Trent's herd, he sent me over to close the deal. So the next thing I knew, I was walking down the main street on my way to the bank where I was supposed to meet Trent. Hey, well, it sure was a nice day. Kind of Indian summer-like. A lot warmer than it had a right to be in October. The sun had fooled the maple trees into thinking it was spring. A couple of them beside the Civil War cannon in the square were even starting to bud. The two fellas sitting underneath it playing checkers in their shirt sleeves. Eh? Well, it looked like the sun had fooled them, too. <laughs> Howdy. Just a minute, mister. Just a minute till I make this move. There. That ought to hold you, Jonah. Yeah. Now, uh, what was it you wanted, mister? Oh, I didn't want anything. I just said howdy, that's all. Oh, howdy. Well, speak to the man, Jonah. He spoke to us. It's my move now. I'll do my talking afterward. Yeah. Howdy. Oh, it's a nice day. Yeah. Well, so long. Uh, hold up there a minute, son. Hmm? Hey, see that gun of his, John? Mm, yep. You, uh, you ain't Brett Ponsett, the six-shooter. My name's Ponsett, yeah. You hear that, John? He's Brett Ponsett. Yep. And we was kind of wondering when you was going to show up, Mr. Ponsett. Been expecting him for the last month or so. What's that? Yeah, when you got to jump, you got to take it. That's the rule. All right, all right, yep. John. All right, I know the rule. Well, we'll take it then, take it. All right. Yeah. <laughs> there. You satisfied? Yeah. You you said something about expecting me. Oh, sure. Okay. Ever since we heard the news, congratulations. Why? He said congratulations. Now well, let's get on with the game. All right. Yeah. You're moving. Yeah. How in thunder should I know? All this chattering going on. Well, I don't like to keep you interrupting, but I wonder if you would mind explaining just what you meant by by. Shh. Jonah's trying to think. Yeah, I know, but what I, I, I don't I... want him to claim I beat him because we kept him from concentrating. No, 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 no. Of course not. No, I. I, I... <laughs> Well, I knew that the Trent cattle would turn out to be good stock. The Double G was lucky to be buying them. But since they weren't going to belong to me, I couldn't see why congratulations were in order. Unless folks in Powder Creek had heard wrong, unless they thought I was outfitting a ranch of my own. And I started to explain things to the fellows playing checkers, but they shushed me again, good, good and loud this time. So I gave up and went on town toward the bank. I was just passing by the newspaper office when I bumped into Quint Todd. He was editor of the Powder Creek Press, a weekly newspaper. Matter of fact, he was more than just an editor. Quint Todd retired last 
six or seven years, and he was putting out the paper practically a single hand. And... Afternoon, Quint. Huh? Yeah. Oh, that's you, Ponset. So you finally got here, huh? Well, I'm here, if that's what you mean. I didn't realize folks were so anxious about me. Some of us are anxious, maybe. Some of us ain't. Ah. Uh-huh. What, are you, you upset about something, Quint? Why should I be upset? Oh, I don't know. I don't know. If things are all right, aren't they? I mean, with the paper. And... Paper's fine. I'll save you the next issue so you can see your name in print. See, my... Well, I sure can't think any reason why you'd be writing about me. It's customary, ain't it? What? It's customary to write about the groom. The groom? The what? what? I'm busy now, Ponson. I got a story to run down. Oh, well, Quint, no, well, l- I hope you'll to... be real happy. Both of you. No, but Quint, I... Hey, for Pete's sake, Quint, wait, Quint! Well, he lost his senses. That's the only explanation of that. You'd Quint taught it, just plain lost his senses. That me being a groom, me? And who in the Sam Hill did he think I was going to marry? How... I, I hadn't even been keeping company. Not that I have anything against marriage, you understand. I... Like people say, it's an institution, a, a noble institution. Why, some of my best friends are married. And I, I suppose someday, not right away, of course, not very soon, but someday, maybe I'll... Well, I... Hey, hello, Britt. I was on my way to meet you. Huh? huh? What's the matter? You look like you just fell off a bronc. Oh, hello, Trent. I uh, guess I was kind of preoccupied. I was thinking about something. Oh, well, I reckon we shouldn't expect you to have all your faculties in good working order. <laughs> Not at a time like this, huh? Huh? What? <laughs> oh, sure was a surprise. Never thought I'd see the day when some woman would put a saddle on you. <laughs> what? <laughs> well, we better get over to the bank. I told Mr. Frederick we'd be there uh, by three about. Uh, he's drawing up the papers. Sure, sure. Uh, uh, Trent. Yeah? Now, about me getting married, the fact of the matter is, I... Oh, Fred, you know I was just joshing with that saddle talk. Oh, yeah. Oh, I, I know, I know. But... It's high time you did put down some roots. Maybe so. Maybe yes, so, Trent. Sir, you I... just wait till you got a family of your own. Why, you'll be a different man. Oh, that's possible. <laughs> that's possible, Trent. Uh, but just where did everybody get the notion that I was almost well, ready to... Now, you didn't think you could keep it a secret, did A secret? <laughs> well, you ought to know many better than that. Many? <laughs> yeah, that's who told me. Well, of course, there'd been rumors going around for several weeks, but until I heard it from Minnie herself... Oh, wait, wait, hold on here. You mean Minnie Flint? Well, who else would I mean? It's her niece you're marrying, ain't it? <laughs> You act so strange about uh, look, uh, look, now, I just want to get this straight. Many Flint told you I was marrying her niece? Well, she told everybody. I say. Well, now, Britt, I, I know how a man feels when he's getting ready to jump overboard. <laughs> I felt the same way myself, sort of awkward and embarrassed. Well, be that as <laughs> you it may. You folks or... didn't know about it so they wouldn't poke fun the way they always do. <laughs> uh, but you can't blame Minnie for spreading the news. Well, I sure do blame her. Well, now, Britt, Minnie's been like a mother to hell and raised her since she was a baby. Well, Helen ain't never had no folks of her own. I know that. I know that. Well, then, you shouldn't mind Minnie being proud. Why shouldn't she do a little bragging, huh? Well, of course. Oh, uh, the women folks around here seem to think you're quite a cat. Oh, now, listen, <laughs> Diane. Now, Trent, well, let me tell you something. Here's the bank. I suppose that you'll want to get this business done with pronto so you can get straight over to Minnie's place, huh, Rip? <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah, I w- would like to get over to Minnie's. I'm coming. Just a minute, I'm coming. <gasps> Brit. You mind if I command many? Why, uh, well... Excuse me. Thanks. It's sure nice to see you, Brett. I... I didn't have any idea you were in Potter Creek. I didn't have any idea at all. Uh-huh. You, uh huh. You're just passing through, ain't you? You're not staying. Oh, uh, some folks seem to think I am. I at least long enough to get married. Oh, you've heard. Well, so is everybody else, as far as I can tell. Your announcement of my engagement seems to have blanketed the whole town. Now, Britt, I can explain. 
Well, that's why I'm here. Why don't you just sit down over there on the sofa? I've got some oatmeal cookies out in the kitchen. I just made them this morning. Manny? Yes? You just uh, can forget about the cookies. I really don't have much of an appetite. Oh. Well. I'm waiting, man. Well, uh, you see, Britt, I only did it for Helen. Now, she's a fine girl, and well, I, I wanted to help her out. Oh. On account of Quint. Of Quint Todd. They've been going together for nearly six years now, but he just never seemed to get around to asking her to marry him. Well, he must have his reasons. A man usually does. Oh, it's because of his father. You see, Quint's been taking care of old man Todd ever since he retired. And it must cost money, him being so sickly all the time. Uh Uh-huh. But Quint could have married her. Helen don't expect a lot of fancy clothes in a fine house. She's the practical type. Uh, I just, just what has this got to do with me? Uh, well, I, I had an idea. I thought if maybe there was somebody else, if Quint believed Helen was interested in another man, well, maybe he'd come to his senses and take the bull by the horns and uh, marry her himself. Okay. You've been sort of using me as a decoy. Is that... Uh... The idea? I knew you was working for the double G. It didn't seem likely you'd be showing up in these parts. Uh, not for the time being, anyhow. And afterward, well, after Quentin and Helen tied the knot, then it wouldn't matter. Well, you ought to be ashamed of yourself, men, both you and Helen. You don't think she knew about it. She didn't? Of course not. I didn't dare tell her. Why, she'd have never stood for it. Well, then how on earth did you manage to convince her that I was, uh, that I was uh, interested? I... I've got a sister living over in Black Mountain. Uh, that's not far from the double G. No, but what I mean is, how did you well, ever... Well, I hmm? sent her some letters and asked her to post them for me. They were... Uh, they was love letters. But I sort of changed my handwriting and uh, signed your name. Manny Flint. <clears throat> uh, I guess you might as well know the rest, too. When Helen answered them, uh, when she wrote back to you, well, I kind of saw to it that her answers never got mailed. Well, well, I just don't know what to say. Oh, I never dreamed it'd go this far, Britt. I was sure Quint would start talking serious when he first found out that you and Helen were corresponding, but he didn't. And then, well, I thought maybe if your letters got a little more uh, sincere, uh, well, maybe that would make him jealous. I left him around where he couldn't help seeing them whenever he come calling. You didn't actually propose in my name. Oh, no. Well. Brent. Well, uh, n- not in so many words, right. but uh, reading between the lines, well, that's how Helen took it. She wrote you her answer two weeks ago. She wrote yes. What? Your, uh, your letters were mighty convincing. Well, then you better start figuring out some way of unconvincing her. Well, I don't know. Maybe... Look, look, men, now, Helen's got to know the truth. And if you won't do it, well, I'll just have to tell her all about it myself. Because... Oh, I'll well, get maybe you get... What, oh. oh, Brent? Well, well, you're here already. Hello, Helen. Oh, my goodness. It sure is good to see you, Brent. You, you're looking fine. I saw you, Helen. I saw you. Uh, I, I wish I'd known you were coming. I wouldn't have been out doing the market. No, it didn't matter. It didn't matter. Oh, Britt, I just got to tell you. Maybe I shouldn't say it right out like this, but well, ever since I was a little girl, I've looked up to you so. Why, it just seemed to me you were the finest man that ever came through Powder Creek. Now, now, Helen. Uh... Of course, I, I never guessed it someday... Well, that you and I... Oh, Britt, I'm so happy about it. Excited and happy. I just hope you're as pleased as I am. Are you, Britt? Uh, 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 sure, uh, Helen. Uh, sure. Sure. return to James Stewart as the six-shooter in just a moment. Every man and woman in the armed forces will tell you the only call that takes precedence over mess is mail call, 
And when a letter is more important to a hungry G.I. than food, you know it means something. And the truce in Korea is no reason why we should stop writing letters to our men and women in service, whether in U.S. camps or overseas. Mail from home is just as important now as it ever was. Oh, yes, and be sure to mail your soldier's Christmas packages this week. In that way, you'll be sure he'll receive them in time to make his Christmas away from home a little more cheerful. Now, Act Two of The Six Shooter, starring James Stewart as Britt Ponsett. There just wasn't anything else to say. There just wasn't. I couldn't tell Helen that I'd never really thought about her in a Marian way. And besides, many, she caused all the trouble. It was, his, it was her place to set things right. Min didn't open her mouth. Uh, she just stood there staring at us through her bifocals, real pleased with herself. Well, uh, the next thing that happened was Helen invited me to supper. Oh, boy, I sure didn't want to accept. All I wanted to do was just get out of the house and get out of Powder Creek, too, but... But what I wanted to do and what I did were two different things. I went back to the hotel where I was stopping, changed my shirt, and I rode out to Minnie's again. I guess Britt doesn't like my cooking at Minnie's. Hardly eating a thing. Oh, it's not that, Helen. Everything is fine. I, I had a pretty big dinner at noon, and it uh, kind of stayed with me. More coffee, Britt. No, no thanks, man. Well, you'll have to tell me your favorite food, Britt, so I'll know what to fix after... I, uh, well, I sort of like most everything. Apple pie, I bet. Most men like apple pie. Why, whenever Quentin and I went up... Oh. Speaking of Quint, I ran into him today. I'd just as soon not discuss him. Always, always seemed to me to be an awful nice sort of a fella. Quint. Please, Britt. Oh, 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 sorry. Well, <clears throat> I'll just rid up the table. Oh, here. Here, let me help. No, no, no. I can manage. Besides... You two have lots of things to talk over. Well, all right. Real warm night for this time of year. Moon, too. A harvest moon. Oh, I, I, I hadn't noticed. We ain't taken down the porch swing yet, Britt. Oh, that's all. It... Uh... Might be kind of nice to sit outside for a spell. Well, whatever you say, Helen. Whatever you say. Are you sure you're not too cold out here? Oh, no. Uh-huh. No, I'm fine. Besides, if I do get chilly... You could sort of... <coughs> Helen. Yes, <coughs> uh, <coughs> Helen, uh, about, about us getting married, uh, we uh, we may not be able to have the wedding right away. Oh? Uh, well, you see, over at the Double G where I'm working, there's no place we could live. Well, you, you wrote me you had a cabin all to yourself. I did. And... You said it would fix up real easy, that there'd be plenty of room for both of them. Well, it would. It would have fixed up easy, Helen. But last week, there was a kind of a fire, and that cabin just burned right down to the ground. Oh, I see. There's nothing left of it now but just a few ashes. And that's one of the reasons I came over here to Powder Creek to explain about us having to postpone the ceremony, you see. Well, you don't have to stay at the Double G, do you? Yes, I do. Yes, yes, I do. I, I signed up for all of next year. Don't have any choice. So maybe maybe we ought to not be formally promised. I mean, if somebody else came along, I wouldn't blame you not for waiting. Britt, there won't be anybody else. Oh, you never know. You, know, you never and, know. And a year isn't very long to wait. A year isn't long at all. No, no, I guess not. But just in case. Waiting. Just... I've got an idea. We don't have to wait. Hey, we uh, can be married right away before you go back to the double G. Then afterward, I can stay on with that men. There'd be times when we could be together, when when you come over to Powder Creek for a week or so, like now. I never thought of that. You, 
You don't seem very anxious, Britt. From the sound of your letters, I thought you wanted to get married. Oh, me? sure. Oh, sure. That's... It's just... I... Oh. Oh. Well. Well, looks like somebody's riding up this way. Why, it's Quint. Quint Todd. Oh. Oh. I'm going in the house, Britt. I don't want to talk to him. Oh, now, well, I, I thought you and Quint used to be pretty good friends. Yeah, that's was... all we were, just friends. He didn't mean anything to me, not really. Oh, well, you sure start running every time the name's mentioned. Or... I'm not running. Oh. All right, I'll stay. Yeah, well, good evening, Quint. Hello, Ponsett. Helen. Good evening. You left word at the press office you wanted to see me. I left word. Uh, no, no, he means me, Helen. What? Uh, well, I figured he'd want to get the details on our plans. The paper comes out tomorrow, doesn't it? That's right. Yeah, well, I... I just want to tell you, you couldn't have come at a better time. You see, we just finished settling things. The ceremony's going to be this week. Haven't decided on a day yet. But how's Friday, Helen? Oh, well, well, yes, yes. The sooner the better. The sooner the better. You're Friday, then. Church wedding. Oh, of course, of course. I want everybody to come. Everybody in town. You better say so in the paper. There won't be time to send out formal invitations. You're invited, too, of course, Quint. I'll try and make it. There won't be much of a honeymoon. I'm heading back for the double G first part of next week. Helen's going to stay here with her aunt. She, she's going to stay in Powder Creek? Or for the time being, anyway. Don't sound like much of a marriage to me. Well, it's not the way we'd prefer it, but of course, you know, you can't always fix things up perfect. You have to take the better with the sweet, you know. Yeah, well, when I get married, I'll have a house for my wife and some money in the bank. There are more important things than houses and money. You never said so before. I never said I wanted a house of my own, did I? Well, no. But I couldn't ask you to move in with me and Pa, the way he's ailing all the time. That was just an excuse. If you loved me, you'd have asked. I did love you. You must have known I did. How was I to know? There's, there's no point in hashing it over now. Good night. No, no, hold on, hold on now. Hold on, Quint. Now, just, just, just a minute. Now, I, I want to get this thing straight now. Oh, I, I could hardly believe my ears just now. You, you said you were in love with Helen? I still am, if you want to know it. Quint. Well, I sure don't like the sound of this. I, uh, Helen's engaged to me. How I feel about her doesn't matter. It's how she feels that counts. Ah, but if you're in love with her, now how do I know she's not in love with you? It's pretty plain that she isn't. I don't know. I don't know. You know, being in love usually works both ways, you know. I don't know about this. Well, Helen, what about this now? Fred, you, you know I, I don't care anything about him one way or the other. Now, is that the truth? You talking the truth now? You, we're not starting our marriage on a lie now, are we? Well... Maybe I was fond of Quint once, but that was before... Well... You're all over it now. All over it? Are you sure? I'm promised to you. Yeah, yeah, but I, uh... I, I wouldn't hold you to that promise. As a matter of fact, I'd insist you break it if I thought there was somebody else. Well, that's mighty generous of you, Britt. But you don't need to worry. Of course, if our marriage didn't go through, I'd be kind of upset. Hurt. Maybe. Oh, I wouldn't ever hurt you, Britt. Not for anything. Oh, I'd get over it. I'd get over it. A man always does. At least I always have before. Sure. Oh, sure, sure. Lots of times. Oh, yeah. But you wrote me that I was the only girl you, you ever... Oh, oh well, I, I... To tell you the truth, I, I, what I meant was that uh, you were the only girl I'd ever been engaged to, you see. Oh. That's what I meant. <laughs> it looks to me like the choice is up to you, Helen. Yes, yes, I I think that's the way I see it, too. If you're smart, you'll choose Ponson. I sure haven't got anything to offer you. Just a small-town newspaper that wouldn't even give us a decent living. Oh, now, stop talking yourself down, Quint. Now, the Powder Creek Press, one of the finest weeklies in this part of the country. Now, you know that. Well, Britt, he's a six-shooter. Why, he's practically famous. All I am is a cowpoke. I'm just an old cowpoke. I don't even know whether I'm going to have a job from year to year. Just, just a, the same. Just I an old any cowpoke. girl in the territory would be pleased. Oh, be quiet, both of you. I think neither one of you wants me. I know who you are and what you are. And I know which one I'm... Which one I... Britt. Uh -huh. You're getting a fine man, Helen. Quinn, I told you to be quiet. Britt, 
I'm sorry. I hope you won't think that I'm, I'm fickle or, or don't know my own mind. But, well, you... You are the stick shooter. You don't really need a wife. Helen, you don't mean you're going to take me. And Quint... Well, he needs somebody to look after him. I've seen that house of his. Well, I'll bet the place hasn't had a good spring house cleaning for the last four years. But Quint's father, he's a nice old man. And with a woman to look after him, maybe he won't be so sick all the time. Well, you still haven't said that you love Quint. Why? Well, I guess I've been in love with him ever since. You won't think too badly of me, Quint. No, no. No, I... It's kind of a blow, I guess. But like I said, it took a little while to get over it, and I'll, I'll manage somehow. I'll, uh, uh, I'll manage. Well, I left Quint and Helen standing out there on the porch. I went inside to get my hat. Minnie was hovering by the front window. When she saw me, she shut it real quick. And tried to appear innocent. Well, it looks like your scheme finally worked out, man. My scheme? Seems to me it was more yours than mine. Well, what, what are you talking about? You know very well that you're asking Quint over here tonight was what brought things to a head. Well, I, I just wanted to make certain he had all the facts about our wedding, that's all. Right? So the story in the paper would be accurate. Oh, it's sure, all. Yeah, sure, I know. <sighs> Poor Quint. What? Well, I guess he deserved it after making her wait all this time. Well, what do you mean, Minnie? Well, I was just thinking. He's going to have to toe the line real close, and he's not going to win many family arguments, neither. Well, I don't see why well, not. Well, I'll tell you why not. Every time Helen has trouble with him, all she'll say is, don't forget I could have married the six-shooter, but I gave him up for you. And Quint will just have to sit there and take it, no matter how often she says Oh, now, man. <laughs> Well, Quint and Helen were married the following Sunday. I stayed over for the wedding. Matter of fact, I was best man. Both of them insisted on that. But I didn't enjoy the ceremony very much. I, uh, I kept thinking that, you know, that, that it could have been me standing there saying the I do. And, gee, what a short, a close call. The Six Shooter is an NBC Radio Network production in association with Review Productions. It is based on a character created by Frank Burt, and the transcribed story is written by him. Mr. Stewart may currently be seen in the Universal International picture, The Glenn Miller Story. Others in the cast were Barbara Eiler, Virginia Gregg, Bill Johnstone, Sam Edwards, and Herb Biker. Special music for this program was by Basil Adler, and the entire production is under the direction of Jack Johnson. All characters and incidents were fictitious, and any resemblance to actual characters or incidents is purely coincidental. This is Hal Gibney speaking. Well, Hearth and Homies, I hope you enjoyed tonight's show, The Six Shooter, starring Jimmy Stewart. Just a reminder, if you haven't heard, <laughs> this channel is supported entirely by viewers like you. Now we have almost 13,000 subscribers, about 36,000 unique viewers each month. And I was trying to think of the percentage of people that we needed to come over to uh, join the Johnny Dollar Club and if we just had a dollar from each person. But in the end, I don't know what the percentage is, but what I do know is we need you to go check it out and see what you can do. The support level started just a dollar a month. You get some access to exclusive content and I'll be adding more content as the support grows and I'm able to spend more time with the channel. So think of yourself as a ground floor investor in the Hearth and Home Entertainment Partner Program. <laughs> but either way, we're just glad that you're here. Make sure you like this video and subscribe. And thanks again for tuning in.